Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Lucky Journal Stars Life in the Red podcast. Luke Mullen and Amy Just, another action-packed week. A lot to get through today. Uh, major, major news, of course. When we came on last week, we were in the midst of uncertainty about Trev Albert's status. Well, today we'll get into all that, um, unpack kind of what, what we've learned in the last few days, and of course, look ahead to NCAA tournament action. That is the headline of this week, two teams in the NCAA tournament for Nebraska. Really incredible. And they're playing the same school. <laughs> yeah. That there's, no, there's no connections none, there to that none school. None at all. That hasn't happened in over a decade where a men's team and a women's team from the same school end up playing the same school. Hasn't happened in a really long time. Yeah. Really rare nationally um, for it to happen to Nebraska in these circumstances. Um, very peculiar uh, all the storylines will emerge and all of that to follow this week. But I think starting off, we want to talk about Trev Alberts. And as I mentioned um, last week on our podcast, it was a lot of uncertainty. And so just to kind of go back to that last Wednesday, um, the events of the day, it was wild. You know, in the morning, the reports came out and then all day it was kind of a, will he leave? Will he stay? And then eventually that evening, uh, Trev Alberts officially leaves Nebraska for Texas a and I'm still, like, at a loss. Um, so uh, his um, introductory press conference is, like, currently happening as we are recording this. Um, very jarring, and it still doesn't look quite right. Him and Maroon um, fans are rightfully pissed. Um, you know, The responses from those within the athletic department have been very diplomatic, um, but they were all very surprised. Um, Definitely a wild week and one to remember for sure within Nebraska for the rest of time. And certainly I agree with you. It just feels so weird. I've, you know, he's, he's been tweeting. He's Trev Alberts. He's been tweeting and I see him pop up with his Texas A&M logo. I'm like, gosh, who is that? Like, who am I even following from Texas A&M? Like, it's a weird, a weird situation. And I agree with you. That'll take a little bit of a time to to sink in a little bit. But um, as we kind of zoom out, you know, go big picture on this decision, um, leadership, that is a word that has come up often um, from Trev Alberts, from people talking about the situation. Um, a couple here, really quick quotes that I want to read off to discuss real quick. Um, Governor Jim Pillen, um, he was casting blame at the Board of Regents, the lack of a, a permanent university president said, quote, failures of leadership uh, was a major factor in Trev's decision. And worth noting that the Board of Regents will be meeting uh, Wednesday morning to continue discussing potentially that permanent presidential candidate. But Trev Alberts' introductory statement at Texas A&M, he said, leadership matters now more than ever. And as well, Trev talking to our colleague Sam McCune from the Omaha World Herald, uh, he said, quote, these are hard jobs they're even harder now than they've ever been. And leadership is just really critical. Yeah. And when um, Trev spoke um, just a few minutes ago addressing the 12th man, he said very similar things um, that he's worked for some great leaders and then some not so great leaders. Um, that's a paraphrase, not a direct quote. But he also echoed the leadership matters, matters now more than ever before. And I honestly lost track of how many times he, he said the word leader and leadership in his like opening remarks. Um, so that's definitely something that's front of mind for him as he makes this change. Yeah. And certainly there's been a, a big discussion, of course, here in Nebraska about that leadership, about what's going to happen uh, to this president role, this athletic director role. Well, for now, there's an interim AD in place. Uh, Dennis LeBlanc, who is Nebraska's Executive Associate Athletic Director for Academics. And regardless of sport, it seems like every coach, every athlete has had a positive run-in with Dennis. That's what we've heard, um, not just this week, but of course, you know, in the past too. He's a very, very well-respected and veteran figure in that athletic department. Yeah, he, I don't think it would be a stretch to say that he is the longest tenured or among the longest tenured people in that area of the athletic department, um, brings a ton of stability, a ton of connections. Uh, there's a lot of respect there. Um, it, I mean, Matt said today that he has saved lives, mm-hmm. changed lives with the work that he's done, um, helping people finish their degrees, um, 
getting their life on track um, in that regard. Um, and no one that I can see has ever said a bad word about him. Yeah. I mean, you look at the success that Nebraska has in terms of academic All-Americans. I mean, that's him. That's his staff that have done a great job of setting that up. And from a, you know administrative standpoint, too, I mean, he's exactly who you want. Somebody visible, uh, somebody who people know, who you might not feel like, hey, the sky's falling. Uh, if this guy's in charge, he's able to see uh, Nebraska through this transition. And who knows, you know, ultimately how long it'll take to get that permanent athletic director position filled. But what we do know is some of the reaction that we've heard from coaches around the university, um, Amy Williams and Fred Hoiberg, in very similar circumstance, their teams in the midst of great, great seasons, NCAA tournament runs, um, and both of them kind of not not to say that this athletic director decision is overshadowed, but it's certainly taken a little bit of the attention away from them. And they've been very, very focused saying, hey, we're going to we're going to focus on the basketball here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They, they both wished him well. And they're like, we have a, we have a job to do right now. Yeah. And granted, Fred's comment on that came before the news of Selection Sunday. Yes, certainly. And um, also worth talking about here, we uh, we heard from football head coach Matt Rule today. Um, he was able to address uh, this Trev Albert situation. Again, this is right before spring practice starts. It was supposed to be, we're supposed to talk about spring practice, maybe the roster, but it was it was mostly about Trev, um, which you understand because this is a, a big, big decision um, that impacts this Nebraska football program for the future. And, uh, you know, we talked about it last week, like Matt Rule came to Nebraska in a big part due to Trev and he was very complimentary. You know, he, he wished him the best, talked about how he's a good friend. But at the same time, I mean, Rule, as he often does, he was very uh, pragmatic, I suppose, to say about, hey, we got to look at this leadership, look at our investment, um, our commitment, because without Trev, you know, that's a, a big, a big, um, you know, ally in his corner that is is no longer there. Yeah. And for people who kind of want to know how the sausage is made, this press conference was called before anything happened with Trev. So this was not like an emergency. Let's talk about spring press conference. Like this was scheduled like a few days before Trev left. So for those who wanted to know how that works. Um, but yeah, no, definitely takes the shine away a little bit from spring football because most of what he talked about today was like big picture stuff. Obviously, yeah. there were some nitty gritty details about like the freshman quarterbacks and stuff like that. But this was definitely more of a big picture, big idea, uh, you know, preaching session uh, mm -hmm. rather than um, an update ahead of spring football. Yeah. And just uh, a real, real quick quote. want to read you from Rule uh, from this one. He said, we have to be unabashed in our desire to be the best. We cannot worry about optics. We cannot worry about what people say. The way to win in collegiate athletics today is to invest. So, Really, uh, I think that's kind of a, a call, call to action out there, um, as he often does. But again, you know, fully committed to his role in rebuilding this Nebraska football program. That was a very brief uh, moment there. And as we wrap up this Trev, uh, Trev discussion before we move on, finish up football and some of this tournament talk, I think it's got to talk about his legacy. I mean, this is this is a hugely relevant, you know, black shirt guy who's meant a lot to this uh, athletic program and. As you mentioned, fans are very, very upset with the way he left. Like, this is this is going to impact the way that Nebraska fans view him in the long term. Oh, yeah, without question. I think that it's not similar to the way things unraveled for Scott Frost. But at the same time, it is also similar because regardless of what was accomplished or was not accomplished, things ended poorly um for both of them in terms of just how the exit happened and i think that i don't i don't know if trev is going to be welcomed around here for at least a while because the way that he left it just it didn't sit right with a lot of people and there were some who want his name off of Memorial Stadium. That's not going to happen. Yeah, I think I think that's a little bit of an overreaction. That's not going to happen. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's definitely... It goes back to the point that I made, you know, 
a while ago with Frost. It's if you come back to your alma mater, what does that do for your legacy if things go south? And not that things went south for Trev publicly while he was here, but the exit, I think, has radically shifted how people feel about him. Um, Not necessarily the things that he accomplished here, but just about him personally. Yeah, really good point. I think it's just fans want commitment and everything I think that that Trev did in terms of Volleyball Day in Nebraska, Memorial Stadium changes, you know, where Nebraska is in terms of this collegiate landscape. Like, I think it was really good forward thinking, but you can't leave before the job is done. And that's exactly what he did. And that's why people are upset because you have this long-term vision, you got to stick it through. And that's not, that's not what happened. No, he yeah, didn't even get to his three yeah, year. Three year anniversary. No, nope. some, uh, some sad, sad times uh, for, for fans who wanted to see Trev Albert stick it through for the long run. But that is that situation. Um, again, he has departed, gone to Texas A&M to be their new athletic director. So Nebraska, they got to move forward. And that will be a, a major topic here uh, in the next couple of weeks and months moving forward. But really quick, wanted to just make another point about the spring football, hearing from Matt Rule today. Um, really interesting to hear kind of a little bit about the winter workouts because, you know, it's always kind of like behind the curtain a little bit. You know, we, we don't get a great glimpse into what they're doing. But, you know, he was saying, hey, like they really ratcheted up the competitiveness um, not just in terms of, you know, the fun things. It's, you know, it's like going through the mad drills, going through these long, long days of workouts, and then you've got to be competitive. And Matt Rule, you know, he doesn't pull any punches. He's honest. He said, I'm really, really pleased with the way the team has responded. I think that's a, a really good sign. Yeah, I think so too. And you never know, right? Because yes, like Rule's been here, but there's still a lot of new pieces, whether that be transfers or incoming freshmen, early enrollees, or what that looks like, or, you know, for the people who've been here, like, how does it compare to last year? They didn't know what to expect last year. They kind of do this year, but, like, things are still different. Like, every season is its own journey. Um, And so what that looks like from their perspective, and pleasantly surprised so far. Yeah, last year was establishing the standard. This year, they're trying to raise it. So really, uh, really, the spring football, it's getting, it's going to start next week. You know, we're talking about it now, but they'll start practicing next week. We'll know a lot more then as they start to get through those practices, get these players on the field. So look forward to that and uh, all that moving forward. But hey, we got some, uh, we got some basketball to talk about here. Two tournament teams. And we'll start off today on the men's side because that bracket was set um, first. And (laughs) we got to talk about uh, how the bracket shakes out. But first worth going back to the Big Ten tournament, you were there. Um, you got the chance to see a, a really big win, Nebraska over Indiana. Kese Tominaga showing his star, kind of the world, and then the semifinal letdown the next day against Illinois. But just kind of that that Indiana game, that was a, a really special moment for this Nebraska team that has struggled at the Big Ten tournament. Yeah, they had not won a game at the Big Ten tournament in Fred's tenure. Um, they had never made the semifinal since being at, uh, in the Big Ten. The last semifinal Nebraska has made in a conference tournament was in 2006, a long time ago. So I just think this team is capable of doing a lot of good things. Granted, the Illinois game just gave you deja vu from some of the other letdowns in this season after they had such a strong first half and then things kind of unraveling there. Um, didn't help that Terrence Shannon went off for a 40 burger. Yeah, you're not, you're not going to beat many teams when their best player scores 40 points. No. Yeah. And especially when he's drawing all of the fouls. Yes. Um, a player told me after the game that, you know, he's very skilled at getting fouled and that's the skill now. Yeah. I saw, I saw a lot of people saying, man, you know, he's getting a lot of calls that uh, Casey, Casey doesn't get those calls all season long. So. No, I'm really, <laughs> once the tournament rolls around, I'm really interested to see how Casey is officiated mm-hmm. and then how Zach Eady is officiated. Um, obviously, two very different situations. But yeah, the officiating for Shannon, Tomonaga, and Eady this year has been very bizarre. Yep, all over the place a little bit. Um, and certainly this, uh, that Illinois game, I mean, 
Nebraska start off so great. I mean, that was a fantastic first half. They scored 51, uh, but then, you know, scored 36 in the second, slowed down there, but then 58 second half points for Illinois. That was just way too much. And, you know, I, I think a little bit of the perspective here is, yes, I mean, could have gone to the Big Ten tournament final, could have had all that joy that came with it, but... Hey, Fred Hoiberg was brought in to to win an NCAA tournament game, not necessarily to win the Big Ten. Yeah, but you know, it helps prepare you for that, right? Like, the Big Ten tournament, like, how it's set up, much harder than the NCAA tournament. You don't have to play every day. You don't have to, you know, go play, like, an 8.30 p.m. game and then turn it around and play at 2.30. Like, that's not happening there. So yeah, it prepares you, um, for what you, um, not could expect cause you, they don't do it that way, but just the level of intensity and having to, you know, burn the candle at both ends and just be ready for anything and stay on your A game despite, you know, having a full season behind you and yeah, you're tired and yeah, you're hurt, but you want to go for glory and it's all of those things. And I think what they, were able to do, um, and this is applicable for both the men and the women, um, what they were able to do at the Big Ten tournament helped set them up for success um, this upcoming week. Yeah, and still a, a very enjoyable run for the fans to follow. I think they were just disappointed, you know, you didn't get yeah. at least one more game out of it. So yeah. uh, that was how the the men closed uh, the Big Ten tournament. And of course, NCAA tournament seedings came out uh, the very next day. In Nebraska officially in the field, first NCAA tournament appearance since 2014. We knew it was happening, but credit to Fred Hoiberg for everything he did to assemble this roster and then the players for how they've come together this season. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You, you know, around the country, there was not much hope for them to continue to clear the bar. Um, preseason number 12, and then they finished number three, which is wild yeah. and incredible. And just knowing that they didn't have a first-team All-Big Ten player and, you know, the coaches considered Casey second team, but not the media. Like, the the perception around this team is that they just were going to be okay again. Yeah. And then they went out and did some really special things this season. Yep. Took down a number one team. Uh, really, really incredible home record as well. Uh, but now it's, it, it's to that time of the year where – all the accomplishments, everything you had before it, it kind of fades away a little bit because it's all about the next game, the biggest game of the season ahead of it. Nebraska, the number eight seed in the South region, they will be going up against number nine seed, Texas A&M, 550 p.m. on Friday. Yep, Texas A&M. <laughs> How did that happen? The committee has a sense of humor. Um, there are people on the committee with ties to Nebraska, ties to Texas A&M, um, Barry Collier is on the committee. Yep. Like, you know, like for people to think, oh, you know, ha ha. No, it, this is not lost on them at all. They are very well aware of what they did. Yep. They, they understood the storylines uh, that would follow in that matchup and they cedared it away anyway. And uh, Texas A&M, you know, from a basketball standpoint, it's a, it's a very interesting opponent for Nebraska because this A&M team, Uh, They had a a long, you know, five-game losing streak in February. We're really struggling to score the basketball, but they've really turned it around these last couple of weeks, went on a big run in the SAC tournament, nearly went all the way. And when you look at their strengths as a team, it's it's rebounding, it's physicality, it's some of the toughness that Nebraska likes to do too. Yeah, and Texas A&M is not just one of the best offensive rebounding teams in the country. No, they are the best offensive rebounding team in the country the best and it's like not even close between them and like the number two team like it's wild so that's definitely going to be a point of emphasis for Nebraska this week to focus on getting those rebounds you cannot be lazy on those possessions because Texas A&M will bite you a good thing for Nebraska is that Texas A&M does not defend the three very well they also don't shoot the three very well. They are one of the worst teams, not just in the Power Five. They are one of the worst teams in all of Division One in three point shooting. So, this game is going to come down to offensive rebounding for Texas A and M versus can Nebraska shoot from outside the arc? If they can, I don't think it'll be super close. If they can't, it might be ugly. 
And with that three-point shooting, I mean, how big is it going to be to have C.J. Wilcher? Because oh Nebraska goodness. really missed him they, in that game. They needed him in so many ways against Illinois. Like, even if he didn't have the most product, he productive game, like, they needed just him. Period. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, they had an incredibly short bench. They played a set. They, the goal was to play through a seven rotation. Um, and then when you have Josiah Alec uh, get his second and then also bang knees with Terrence Shannon and like need to get that checked out, you have Rank get two quick fouls. What do you do? You go to a true freshman who hasn't played much all season. And you know what? He held his own, you know, good for Matar. That was, you know, was he exploited on a few things? Yes, but he did his job. He did not get into foul trouble. And heck, he he made one of the most wild shots I have seen just like this season. Um, just a pull-up mid-range jumper dribbling b- between his legs. Like, okay, Matar. Um, and to quote Sam Hoiberg, I have... Never seen him do that before. Big emphasis on the never. <laughs> Not even in practice. Um, the bench celebration on that one was, was pretty fun. But yeah, so dominant first half for Nebraska, even with that uh, foul trouble for Josiah and for Rink, but it just all went uh, by the wayside um, in that second half. Terrence Shannon just continuing to draw fouls. Um, Joan Gary fouled out. Pretty early, he was beside himself when that happened. Yeah, pretty upset. And yeah. they, they needed CJ just for to have that extra person, to have like a veteran leader out there. Um, they, they just needed him. And so he was at the selection yesterday, looked to be okay. So that's, that's good. But yeah, when you don't have him as a light scratch. Not great. Yeah. In terms of spacing, the different offensive mm-hmm. sets, they need him out there as that three point shooter. And you get the feeling he's going to be, he's going to be certainly an X factor uh, in this game against Texas AM. And the way the bracket sets up, the number one seed uh, uh, potentially awaiting that winner, that is number one seed at Houston. And to get there, of course, I don't think anybody needs reminding. That'd be historic for Nebraska just to win that first game, finally get it, get it ticked off and get that off their back. That's uh that's the goal that everybody's looking towards. It's unbelievable that this is Nebraska's yeah. 8th NCAA tournament ever for the men and they've never ever won a game at, on that stage. But this team has a very good shot at getting it done. If there's a team that could do it, it's this one. Yes, most certainly. So that is how the bracket shakes out and how it sets up for the Nebraska men's team. As for the women, uh Guess what? They're also playing Texas A&M on Friday night. That is going to be played 9.30 p.m. Nebraska, the number six seed. They will face number 11 seed at Texas A&M. What are the chances of it happening twice? Again, the committee. <laughs> they knew what they were doing. Oh, they they knew. absolutely yeah. knew what they were doing. And to anyone, if, if anyone suggests otherwise... You were sorely mistaken. Yeah, this, this was not random. This was not random chance. Now, they weren't going to do it if the seed, like, didn't line up, mm-hmm. right? Like, if Nebraska would have been, the Nebraska women would have been that eight, like, they wouldn't have done that. But, like, it's there. It was there, and they they seeded it. So, and it, it was interesting, too, because we were talking about the NCAA tournament projections, and a six was not out of the realm of possibility, but... Seven or eight, the, that seemed to be what a lot of different projections um, had Nebraska at. But I think ultimately the the strength of their schedule, some of those uh, big wins that they got, certainly bumped them up to the six. And that's that feels that still feels very fair with the season that they had. Yeah, beating Iowa and then taking Iowa to overtime in their fourth game of the Big Ten yeah. tournament. Like you can't discredit what an accomplishment that is. Um, I do think that loss to Rutgers, that inexplicable loss to Rutgers, um, dropped them from where they could have been um, even higher. But yeah, they deserve to be that six. Yeah. So that was the seeding. And in terms of this Texas A&M opponent, uh, a little bit different season uh, trajectory to get here. 
stormed through their non-conference schedule, um, but took some lumps in a very, very tough SEC um, this season and lost six of their last eight games entering the NCAA tournament, which is kind of interesting because the Nebraska women, on the other hand, are playing their best basketball right now. Yeah, I am of the opinion that the game that Nebraska played against Iowa in the Big Ten tournament championship game was their best game of the season. Mm -hmm. And they happened to lose. Like, I don't think they lost that game. I think Iowa won that game. Um, It just, they played so well. They held Caitlin Clark, of all people, to the worst halves, not just of her season, but of her entire career. And if you can do that, that makes you incredibly dangerous. Um, it would not surprise me if they get out of the second weekend. It, or not out of the second weekend. Excuse yeah. me. That would be nuts. Um, out of the first <laughs> weekend. Um, I just think that they have a really favorable matchup, potential draws, that they that they could make it to Albany. Yep. And so if if Nebraska does win this uh, opening round game against Texas A&M, uh, either number three seeded Oregon State or number 14 Eastern Washington uh, are the opponents. Of course, they'll be out there in Corvallis. Um, so that could be a, a challenging, you know, environment to go into. But you look at the strengths of this Nebraska team. I mean, so strong with Alexis Markowski, and Natalie Potts, um, Jazz Shelley with everything she's done in terms of, you know, scoring, assisting. Um, it just feels like, this team has the pieces that complement each other so well. And they're understanding, you know, at least from what we've seen these last couple of weeks, you, you got to feel that they're going to come into the NCAA tournament uh, very, very aligned with each other and everything. Yeah. And they're rested, right? Yeah, Which also point. helps, yeah. right? You don't want too much rest to where you're rusty, but they're playing their best basketball right now. And I think they are capable of doing some very spe- special things. Yes, it, it is certainly shaping up. Uh, for a lot of excitement for that Husker women's team as well. And again, they will get started 9.30 p.m., a late one Friday night uh, out there on the West Coast. So make sure to, to stay up after that uh, that men's game earlier in the day. And real quick before we get out of here, uh, move on to some updates, baseball and softball, of course, going through some of their weekend non-conference series. Um, the baseball team, man, they continue to win games. They are now 13-5 and five on the year after a three-game sweep of nickels. And offense. Wow, those bats were showing up. Josh Karen drove in five runs in a 7-6 win on Friday. Will Walsh then drove in five runs, a uh, blowout 16 nothing win the next day. And then they scored a, a 11 runs in the 11-4 series finale on Sunday. Really impressive. Football scores. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Like, w- what? Like, that's incredible um, what they were able to do this past week. Um, it'd be, it'd be kind of crazy if they continue to keep it up. Yeah, and I think uh, we we talk about the RPI every week. I think they're number one or number two. They are flying in terms of that uh, that you know different category. But you also look at the pitching too. And I mentioned the bats were good, but Brett Sears he continues to be phenomenal. Uh, six scoreless innings in that Saturday win. The bullpen was really great in that Sunday win as well. So a lot of different factors going well for this Nebraska baseball team right now. And if you want to get a look at them, they have five home games uh, this week here in Lincoln. We'll play Omaha and North Dakota State uh, during those midweek games, Tuesday and Wednesday, and then Mexico State coming to town for three on the weekend. Yeah, might as well. I don't know what the weather's supposed to be like here. Yeah, you might you might be focusing on something else though. <laughs> oh, I, I'm talking about for the listeners. Yes. You know, in between yep. March yep. Madness, get <laughs> get involved with another bit of right. March Madness in a different sport. See if those enough. bats continue to stay as hot as they Not are. Enough screens, I'll tell you what. I will be. Uh, I'll be I'll be checking out softball, I'll be at Bowling Stadium, but I'm gonna I'm gonna need to have that the different basketball going uh, because it is a also going to be a big weekend for this Nebraska softball team, um, especially they have gotten back to winning ways so crucial. Uh, just won five of their last six games at home, five game winning streak as well. Really, uh, really good to see considering the up and down start to the year that they had and these wins. Very similar to the baseball team. The bats, the bats have been going. Ten nothing win over win, over Maine. Uh, they had back to back walk off wins. Big win over Creighton. Big win over Northern Colorado. Average about ten runs a game over this winning streak. Really, really impressive. When the bats are hot, anything is possible. Yeah, and that's that's kind of been the the season story. I think for the softball team is, I think they score five or six runs. I think their their record is is phenomenal, and they score two or three runs, and it's tough. So, um, especially. 
this weekend. A player to keep your eye on, Billy Andrews, uh, who's having a phenomenal, phenomenal year for the softball team. She's now tied for the program record for career home runs, 54 home runs in her career, and a very, very good chance to break it this week. She has uh, 11 home runs, or 10 or 11, excuse me, this season, uh, which puts her in the top five nationally. And she missed a few games, too. I mean, she's been hitting home runs at an incredible rate. Yeah, I really wish I could... uh like try to watch like all of the things this weekend between, you know, actually being present in Memphis for the men, watching the women's tournament. Oh, it's also a NCAA uh, tournament time for wrestling. Nebraska sending nine of their 10 uh, there. Want to be able to watch that. Want to be able to watch Billy Andrews make history. Like what a amazing weekend this could shape up to be for Nebraska athletics. Yeah, a crazy, amazing week. A lot going on, all these different sports. And uh, the schedule for the softball team, they'll face Omaha on Wednesday. And then Big Ten play begins. They're, they're facing Illinois. How? Yep. How are we there yet? <laughs> it's here. Mid, uh, mid-March. mid Yep, three games against Illinois. Uh, Going to be really important for that softball team as well. So, yep, that's, uh, that's a lot of athletics going on. And as always, uh, make sure to stay tuned. Journalstar.com. Amy, you'll be there in Memphis. You'll be following the women's team too. I'll be at softball, be football coverage this week. Brent, our, yep, our Brent Wagner, he'll be there with the women's team following along with them. So much good content, so much good uh, athletic events to, to stay tuned to this week. So as always, we appreciate all of you listeners and viewers for coming to us for your update and Life in the Red podcast. We'll be back at you next week with NCAA Tournament Action. We'll see you then.